Thanks very much for and my proudest accomplishment as I was the first Clydesdale chair. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a little bit, so I'm talking about my disclosures first. So um, I'm currently the president of the American Oil Chemist Society and, and um, I do a lot of consulting on and off with food companies. So currently I'm working, doing some work with Sentient and some small companies in Massachusetts. Uh, and then I'm also a member of the Food Forum at the National Academy of Sciences. So I want to talk a little bit about, and focus a little bit about on plant, um, uh, plants in the diet. And this is because some, I mean, fad diets will have a lot of plants in it, but also I think because vegetarianism and vegan uh, diets are on the rise as well. And there's, we've known for a very long time that increasing our consumption of plant-based foods is a good thing, right? Caloric density, as we heard earlier, can be lower. Nutrient density per calories can be much higher. Um, and you can see this certainly in, in certain types of fruits and vegetables um, and certain, um, certain vitamins are mainly coming from these kind of vegetables as well as minerals. And of course, dietary fiber is all coming from our plant foods. All these benefits of plant-based foods uh, have been linked to all different kinds of uh, improvements in health outcomes. Um, and, also, and some of these health outcomes are not just from the what the plants do in our diet, but also from the bioactive compounds that are in those plant-based foods that, again, we don't find in animal-based foods. And then I would say more recently is the focus on sustainability and how plant-based foods can be much better for our environment um, if they're uh, consumed and raised in the right manners. Um, however, unfortunately, despite knowing this for many, many years, we haven't really been able to make a big impact on the consumer to increase their fruit and vegetable consumption. Um, so this is uh, vegetable consumption from 2003 to 2004 to 2015, 2016. And you can see regardless of the age group, it hasn't really changed at all. Actually, in some ways it's been going down recently because of decreased uh, consumption of potatoes. And you see almost the same identical trend in fruits. In, in fruits. So uh, this has gotten so, um, you know, just besides the fact that we've had the five fruits and vegetables campaign for many, many years, we haven't been able to break into this. And it's gotten to the point where our third major source of vegetables is hamburgers and sandwiches. So we're not really breaking into these inroads and ha helping people to get more fruits and vegetables in their diet. So some of these, there are some challenges of switching to these types of diets. So people that want to go, especially people that want to go vegan, will have to be somewhat uh, careful in the way that they uh, compose their diet. And this is because there's going to be certain vitamins that are, you're not going to get, certain vitamins and minerals that you're not going to get from plant-based diets. And these will have to be supplemented. You can have a, certainly differences in mineral bioavailability. If you're eating only plant-based diets, this is mainly from phytate. Uh, phytate is a great metal chelator, uh, and if, if, as it chelates these minerals, it makes them very difficult to digest. Um, and you can see down at the bottom here that in, Western, in a typical Western diet, your bioavailability of iron is about 14 to 17 percent. Uh, but if you go on a vegetarian diet, that bioavailability number drops as you are increasing uh, your consumption of phytate, which inhibits uh, absorption of this important nutrient. Uh, most plant-based proteins are not, do not have complete amino acid profiles. Uh, so you, in, a, in a good vegetarian diet, a good vegan diet, you're going to need to have combinations of legumes and grains to make sure you get all your essential amino acids. And then if you're truly on a vegan diet, you're probably not going to be getting um, almost any long-chain omega-3s, EPA and DHA, uh, unless you're going to take uh, some form of an algae supplement, which you can get these essential amino acids for. So even despite all these problems, if you, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian and you carefully plan your diet, you can get a very good diet. Um, uh, but you really have to somewhat pay attention, especially for vegans. But there's some other challenges that we have with plant-based foods and, and trying to get more plant-based foods into our diet. And one is that plant-based foods are actually the main source of food waste. So while we talk about sustainability from plant-based diets, 
we're actually throwing a lot of those plant-based foods away. Uh, this is because a lot of them are going to have short shelf life. Uh, a lot of them are going to just have a lot of components that we aren't going to consume. So you're going to have to peel them. You're going to throw away the seeds. Uh, some are very difficult to preserve uh, because they don't withstand heat processing. And then we have um, natural um, uh, reactions that can decrease the, at least the, uh, um, the, 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 the quality of the food, such as browning reactions, which could, would cause people to throw foods away. And then the other thing is that plant-based foods are now the number one source of food safety problems. Uh, this used to be uh, meat and poultry used to lead this. Uh, they've done a lot of different in interventions, and they also have the advantages that you're going to cook these most of the time so that you can decrease food safety risk. Uh, whereas you see, and in, in we certainly see in the headlines now, lots of incidences of, of food safety recalls that are coming from produce. Additional challenges come from what the consumer has to do with these products. Um, there's a lot more preparation if you're gonna buy fresh fruits and vegetables. You're gonna to have to peel and seed and chop and things like that. And you can also see that the waste that goes with this. So it's gonna take you more time to prepare your meal if you're gonna use a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, we all have heard about food deserts, and so we know that certain populations will have a very difficult time even finding fruits and vegetables uh, in their neighborhoods. And then we also have issues with value. So one of the, to me personally, the, one of the biggest challenges we have in the U.S. is how do we get to a, a healthy diet to people who don't have a very high income? And fresh fruits and vegetables are going to be much more expensive, uh, not only because of the price itself, but because the short shelf life, uh, people don't want to buy foods if they're not going to be able to consume them before they go bad. And, and also the short shelf life and the waste issues that go around foods rises and increases the price of these kind of products. And then I think that probably the real driver here and why people don't eat more vegetables especially is because of taste and fruits as well. Right? So we've all had the experience of going and buying very expensive basket of strawberries and getting them home and they don't taste like anything, right? So this is because most or many of the fruits you're gonna see in the grocery store are gonna be picked before they're completely at their optimum taste profile, and they're gonna ripen in the store, ripen at your house, and never get the kind of uh, positive flavors that you would get if you picked those fresh. But the other thing is, is that fruits and vegetables naturally have compounds that don't taste good. Uh, a lot of sour flavors, right? A lot of times the, what the plant does is it has high acid when it's unripe. It converts the acid and during the ripening process those become sugar. So a lot of times we're going to have organic acids in there that are going to make the product sour. We're going to have a lot of issues with astringency and these are because many plant-based and fruit-based products are going to be uh, uh, very high in polyphenols. And also there are sulfur type compounds. So the whole cabbage broccoli family has a whole series of compounds that uh, contain sulfur. And as you cook those products, the flavor changes. So the great example here is the difference in flavor between raw kale and cooked kale. As you cook that kale, the flavor totally changes. And that flavor for many people is objectionable. So there's a little bit of a dilemma here is that these cause problems with flavor and uh, decrease acceptance of plant-based foods. But these same exact compounds are many of the compounds that we say that are the healthy components that you're going to get within a plant-based diet. So what can be done to um, overcome some of these challenges to incorporate more plant-based foods into our diet? Um, one is, as I mentioned, is careful diet planning. Uh, this Gallo Pinto, this is the uh, part, almost the national dish of Costa Rica. I think you see it everywhere. Perfect example of mixing grains and, and legumes together so you get complete amino acid profile. Uh, and then we can do things to try to increase the bioavailability of, of um, the nutrients and, and plants. And in some cases, maybe we need to look at opportunities for fortification, especially for things like long chain omega-3s. Uh, there's a lot that can be done on food waste and sustainability issues. Uh, a lot of the food waste that comes from plants is because they're never actually harvested from the field because they don't look perfect. Those are, um, those are products that are actually per are perfect for processing. They cost less than they 
Uh, they can be processed into something like an applesauce just as easily uh, as a perfect fruit. Um, and then we can do things like byproduct utilization. And you know, one of the big advantages of major food companies is that you produce enough byproduct that you can actually do something with that byproduct to create a new product. Uh, versus the local food and cooking at home, you never make enough waste that you know, the best case scenario you're gonna get is to be able to compost that product. And then when we look at food safety risk, there's a lot of different reasons why plants have higher food safety risks. You know, we have the, the first example of E. coli and apple cider was really due to um, uh, deer that were in the orchards. Um, we see lots of problems with the irrigation water. A lot of the romaine lettuce outbreaks have been in this, have had this problem. Uh, when we had the outbreak of salmonella and cantaloupe, that was due to improper equipment being used. And then when you have something like uh, sprouts, which are very high food safety risk, the, the contamination is actually naturally occurring in the this, in this sprouts. Now, FSMA has been something that, we've, uh, that has started in the last uh, few years, and this is really the attempt to bring food safety all the way back to the farm. And uh, the idea here is, is uh, you know, you, you see a lot of these kind of um, uh, outhouses when you drive around, you look at farmers' fields, and you don't actually see any hand-washing opportunities for these people. So it's all things about hand-washing, using gloves, uh, properly sanitizing equipment. Uh, in the Amherst area, we do a lot of truck farming for the New York and Boston area, and most farmers are cleaning their lettuce in washing machines. Uh, so we have no idea if this is a good idea or bad idea right now, and whether these can actually be properly cleaned. And then we're seeing a lot of technological opportunities with bacterial cyto washing solutions so that we can actually make uh, the products um, to be uh, safe when they get to the consumer. There's also a lot that can be done on the convenience area. We've or, you're already seeing a lot of this, and this is tending to increase in the grocery store. So the whole idea of the bag salads, the pre-crust fruits and vegetables, and all the way back to the days and you know to the canned and frozen products. So there are a lot more convenience products, so you don't have to start from the raw material and go th all the way through the uh, culinary process that can take a lot of time, which is very difficult for people to incorporate into their daily diet. Uh, browning inhibition, there's now several GMOs. There's the Arctic apple, which they've taken polyphenol oxidase out of, or inhibited polyphenol oxidase, so it won't brown. And then also the innate potato. Uh, this is used more on the industry side than it is on the consumer side, but again, this doesn't brown. And also they've uh, managed to take um, arginine out of that, uh, decrease the levels of arginine in the potato, which decreases the formation of acrylamide. Uh, also, I think in the terms of food deserts, there's a lot that can be done to increase shelf life and be, allow these kind of products to make it into even things like convenience stores. Uh, a lot of the reasons convenience stores don't have these is they don't sell them fast enough and they have a lot of waste. And then I think another thing that can be done is to incorporate fruits and vegetables into other products. So we just had a, a couple years ago, did a product where we made uh, taco filling and we used uh, mushrooms as part of that taco filling. So it was a blend of beef and mushrooms. Acceptability is just as high as in some cases was higher than the hamburger alone. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't provide you a full serving of vegetable, but it certainly uh, is a way to increase vegetable intake. And then again, how can we decrease cost? Uh, one of those ways will be to increase shelf life. Um, and then the other thing that has been suggested by many people uh, would be to change subsidy models. So to have subsidies instead of focused on corn and soybean, have them, form, uh, have them focused on fruits and vegetables so prices can come down. Um, I think this is uh, kind of a dream with especially the way government's working these days. Uh, but it certainly makes a lot of sense uh, if we could get it done. Um, on the taste side, um, the downside of our breeding, uh, of breeding and looking at getting fruits and vegetables to the market is, has not been focused on taste. It's been more focused on storage, on transportation, on a lot of things that benefit the farmer, not the consumer. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. We know there's all kinds of heirloom fruits and vegetables that can have better flavor profiles. 
And so there's a lot of opportunities there to actually improve the flavor of vegetables to hopefully increase their acceptability. And then also there's opportunities to use things like bitter and astringency modifiers to try to increase acceptability. So I think in the fruits and vegetables, there's a lot of opportunities for industry to try to help people get more fruits and vegetables. I think people are looking for fruits and vegetables. Um, but sometimes when we try to do this, we run into the second roadblock that we hear a lot about, and that's the ultra-processed foods. So the good food, bad food trend has been around for a long, long time. Uh, clean label is probably a little bit um, more of, a, of an issue that's come a, a more of a recent issue. Um, but these good food, bad food trends uh, can be seen in a lot of different places, and I think the one that's getting a lot of press right now is in the ultra-processed foods realm. So just to familiarize you, if you, if you don't know much about this, uh, this the NOVA classification system, uh, which focuses on all processed foods, has four different classifications. The first classification is unprocessed or minimally processed foods. The second level is processed culinary ingredients. So these are the other things that you would use to make a, a, a non-processed foods. So oils, butters, sugars, et cetera. The third category is processed foods, and this is just minimally, I guess what we call minimally processed. So things like canned food, cheeses, freshly made bread, whatever the freshly means, I'm not quite sure. And then the ultra processed foods. So this is the soda, the sweet and savory package, the reconstituted meats, the prepared frozen dishes. Um, in addition to that, there's other ways that they've tried to define ultra processed foods. Uh, one of those is, is foods that are modified from the individual ingredients, so they don't use any whole foods. They just use the components, several different components to put together to make a food. And I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. And then also foods that are considered to be energy dense, poor sources of protein, dietary fiber, and micronutrients, convenient, hyper palatable, attractive, quasi-addictive, low costs, falsely seen as healthy, highly marketed to encourage overconsumption, and then basically anything related to big food. So this is um, uh, a very broad, broad definition and very difficult to really know what is ultra-processed and what is not ultra-processed. Uh, but certainly is gaining a lot of attention not only and trying to get people to adopt their diets, but also to use this to do adopt policy. Um, so lots of epidemiological studies that are coming out in these, the, the value of these, I, I'm not sure really how to interpret a lot of the value, values of these. <clears throat> but there is one very good clinical study that was run out of NIH, and here's the paper, the citation of the paper. And this was a, a small clinical study with 20 inpatients receiving ultra-processed or unprocessed diets for 14 days. And then the diets were very carefully, so it's a pretty good study. They really did a lot to match these diets and calories, sugar, fat, fiber, and macronutrients. Here's kind of an example of a breakfast that the people would have. So that's the ultra-processed, you can see is sausages and croissants. And the unprocessed, you can see um, what, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that these two we would consider one to be not a good diet and the other to be a, to be a, a, a much more healthy diet. So they gave these foods and people could eat as much as they wanted. And when they evaluated the ad libitum intake, they found that the people that ate the ultra processed consumed more than, consumed approximately 500 calories more per day. Uh, the people that consumed the ultra processed also gained weight, and that weight was highly correlated by how many, uh, their increased intake of calories. And the authors proposed that one of the potential ways that this could have happened is because of satiety effects. Uh, so if, and they did this by measuring several satiety hormones, which showed that there were definitely seemed to be satiety benefits if you ate the unprocessed um, food. So this is a very interesting study. I think there's a lot more that can be done to help us understand why this does, uh, why this does happen. Uh, but I think there are some limitations in trying to get people to adopt to these ultra-processed foods. Um, so one of the things we know, you know, the driver of selling food is taste, value, convenience, nutrition, and sustainability, right? Um, 
if you're going to go to an unprocessed food diet, you're going to spend a lot more time preparing that diet, right? So now we're, we're spending essentially 20 minutes a day preparing our food, and people have a lifestyle that is very difficult for them to increase their, uh, the time they spend on preparing their, their food. So this is going to be difficult for many people to, um, many people to do. Uh, the second thing is, is that um, it takes much more skill in the kitchen. Your culinary skill needs to be better to take the raw materials and produce those and, and convert those into a, to a meal. Um, and this is a big, big challenge because we're now in our second generation of people that don't really know how to cook. Uh, we, we see this on campus all the time. Uh, not only do the students not know how to cook, but their parents didn't really know how to cook. So this is going to be a big lifestyle change to do this. These are also um, diff very different in cost. So in the clinical trial that was run, the um, ultra-processed diet was $106 a week, whereas the unprocessed diet was $151 per week. So 50% more expensive to do the unprocessed diet. Now in the study, um, there's also some other confounding factors, and one was in the ultra-processed diet, it was very low in fiber. So they had to add a lot of fiber. In the unprocessed diet, it was extremely high in fiber, over 30 grams per day, which is not typical for most uh, consumers to, in that, to intake that much diet. And so they had to add. So you see in the, they actually added a lot of fiber to beverages and to yogurts and things like that in the ultra-processed diet. So these, this different type of fiber could, could um, impact the way we digest those foods and could be one of the reasons that the satiety factors were very different because of the different types of fiber that were in there. And then I think the other question is food preference. Uh, so when you do these two types of diets, do you eat less when you eat the unprocessed diet because you just don't like it as much? And you eat more because the processed, highly processed food is more, tastes better. Uh, this is something else that they didn't really try to, cons to control or even do questionnaires around. So it's almost like some of the fad diets, the way you lose weight is you avoid food, right? So the same thing could happen here. If a third of your plate was broccoli, maybe you're eating less food because you don't like the food that's being put on the plate. So the question becomes then is there, do we kind of have a middle ground? How do we figure out how to, because, we, because most people are gonna need to have some kind of processed food in their diet to, to, for their lifestyle. And the example I wanna give here is, uh, is the plant-based meat products. So when you talk about plant-based meats, this striation that's in meat, this is really what these products are trying to recreate because this is what gives a lot of the texture of the product. Uh, the problem is that in plant-based proteins, these are mostly globular storage type proteins versus in the meat proteins were, are very elongated proteins and that's why we see this kind of striation in there. So everything that's done to try to make these plant-based meat products is try to recreate this striation and they do this through extrusion technologies. They try to take that globular plant protein and they put it in an extruder and the protein denatures and lines and then they and then uh, aggregates with other proteins and you can get these types of striated systems and then you can chop this up so you can get a texture that's somewhat like a ground beef. The problem with this is that this, this isn't really very highly appealing in this state, right? So the problem we have is we need to add lots, they need to add lots of other products in here to try to get the texture and the feeling of the meat products. So flavor and flavor enhancers, uh, gums and celluloses for structure and binding, acids for protein modification, starches for moisture binding, fat for moisture lubrication, and then the protein itself. So this is a, the example which what they say in ultra-processed foods, if you're just taking the individual ingredients and you're putting them all together, this is not, it's not healthy, right? And then you're gonna have all these other ingredients in here because you, you're trying to mimic the taste of another food product, in, that, in this case, meat. So even though this is an attempt to move us to, towards more of a plant-based diet and a more sustainable diet, it's not always being accepted in the ultra-processed food realm. And this is a quote from the CEO of Whole Foods, which um, actually called this not just a highly processed food, but a super highly processed food. 
So I think this really shows some challenges that we have uh, that how do we move into these more plant-based diets where they're gonna always be considered into this ultra-processed food realm. Um, so <clears throat> the ramifications of the ultra-processed foods. So number one, ultra-processed foods is really not, nothing about processing. It's not really a correlation between how we process a food and what the health effect of that food is. I think actually a better term is probably ultra-formulated foods, right? So they're really looking at foods that are using a lot of different ingredients in here. Um, the difference between the NOVA classification is that you know, most of the clean label and those kind of um, recommendations have been about synthetic additives, things that we add in small amounts. These have now extended beyond that. So now they're saying don't add starch, don't add isolated protein sources. So this makes it even more restrictive on the kind of food products that could be made if consumers adopt this. And then the other thing is that these are to really adapt a, a non-ultra processed diet, you're gonna have to spend more time cooking, you're gonna have to spend more on your food, and you may have to sacrifice taste in some cases. So some take home. So, Plant foods are gonna continue. We know that we should be eating more plant foods. This continues to be a challenge. Uh, there's lots of benefits, as I mentioned, to plant-based foods. There'll probably be even more pressure from the sustainable, sustainability side to do more plant-based foods. But we, to really get consumers, broad base of consumers to do this, we need to help figure out how to lower costs, decrease waste, make these products more convenient, uh, improve food safety, and also improve taste and texture. So as a food industry, this gives us lots and lots of opportunities, right? There's a lot of things that can be done here uh, that can be uh, create new products to meet some of these goals. On the classification systems, these are here to stay, right? We started with front of the pack, with the new valve, with the Hanford, and now with ultra process, this isn't gonna go away, right? This is continue uh, to be in, in our world. Um, and there'll be many attempts to try to use these kind of systems to help people change their diets. The problem with these systems is that they're poorly defined. They're ever changing. You know, even if you go back to the Mediterranean diet, you can probably find 20 different variations of a Mediterranean diet. So, and then sometimes they're truly misleading. There are certain food products on there that really um, are, are that maybe more personal opinion that there's something that we shouldn't eat versus a scientific proof. And again, uh, these diets are gonna be uh, less convenient, uh, cost more, and in some cases could decrease sustainability because one thing the food industry does is a horrible job at is showing how sustainable they are. Uh, food industry does not waste energy, does not waste and, and does a very good job at using byproducts and things of this nature. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, even though things like ultra processed food have a lot of attention, they may not be widely adopted because they are, will be very, very difficult to incorporate into your um, daily life. Uh, and this is another, so this becomes another great opportunity to create a whole lot of food products that may better fit into these definitions. But I think uh, the thing that's more worrisome here is really the kind of big food conspiracy theories that is surrounding the ultra processed foods, uh, which may mean that no matter what you do as a food industry in making something like the Impossible Burger, they will never be accepted by um, some of these classification systems. So thank you.